This is 18-year-old South Korean pianist Yun Chun Lim. In just a moment, he will strike the final chord of Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto in the final round of the 2022 Van Cliburn competition. And when he does so, the entire piano world is about to collectively lose their minds. Let's watch. Wow. All, all right. Are we doing a standing O? Standing O. Okay. Marin Alsop, feel the emotion. Everybody up. I, sh I should say one thing. I'm from Texas. Texas audiences love their standing ovations. However, this did feel different. Let's listen again. Now, check this out. The orchestra is very into this. Most orchestra members that I know would stomp their feet a few times and then start texting each other about which bar they're gonna go to that night. But these folks are into it. Pause, we have a cellist who's actually put her bow in her lap and is clapping with both hands over her head. I don't think I've ever seen that in my entire life. Everybody in that hall, including the jury, seemed confident they had just heard the gold medalist. I remember leaving the hall in absolutely in an ecstatic way. We didn't talk, but our eyes said it all. It did, and it was very hard, because you know, when you walk down the street back to where our hotel was, you know, the whole audience is there. And meanwhile, we're like dying to just, oh my God, what did we just hear? Gold medal goes to Yun Chun Lim. It's pretty evident that this was no ordinary rock three, played by no ordinary pianist. YouTube commenters went as far as to say that Yun Chun Lim's rock three was not only one of the greatest performances of it ever, but possibly the greatest of all time. Now we have to take such claims with a grain of salt. Open just about any well-known Rock 3 performance on YouTube and you can probably find a commenter declaring it hands down the best. That includes 2017 Clyburn gold medalist Ye Kwon Sun Woo's Rock 3 from the finals. That includes 2001 gold medalist Olga Kearns Rock 3 from the Clyburn finals. So it's easy to dismiss Rock 3 GOAT claims as completely subjective, as just cheerleading for whatever performance you happen to like. Nevertheless, when you hear the world get this hyped about some 18-year-old kid's performance, it's worth taking these claims seriously and asking what made this performance so special. I'm Ben Lottie, concert pianist and recovering piano snob. I'm head of piano at Tone Bass, and I've been a Rock 3 junkie since before Yun Chun Lim was born. In my teens, I would collect recordings and even VHS tapes, like this one, of uh, Vladimir Horowitz performing the Rock 3. It's pretty cool liner notes. I've listened to at least 100 recordings of this concerto, some of them probably over 100 times. Earlier this year, I produced a four hour long course on Rock 3 for Tone Base with Garrick Olson, which by the way, you should sign up for Tone Base and watch because it's pretty awesome. What I'm getting at is I know a thing or two about this music. And in this video, we're gonna watch parts of Yun Chun's performance together to see what all the hoopla is about. Joining me along the way are two pianists who sat on this Clyburn jury, Anne-Marie McDermott and Jeanne Flambavouze who incidentally also have tone based lessons on Bach, Haydn, and Debussy, which you should also check out. All right, let's dive in. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that it was not at all clear from the start that Yun Chan was about to rock the music world. When I asked Annie and Jeanne Flamme to comment on Yun Chan's performance, they both pointed out that it wasn't until halfway through the first movement that they realized something special was going on. From the middle of the first movement, that was it. That was it. That was what we all were hoping for. About halfway through the first movement, all of a sudden, I think we could all take a very deep breath and we could just trust. We could trust that, oh my God, we're experiencing something magical here. So what exactly was happening for the first six or seven minutes of the piece? Like a good long distance runner, Yunshan is pacing himself from the outset. He was playing with a sense of the whole work. This kind of so-called structural playing requires discipline and maturity, the kinds of things most teenagers lack. Right after five or six seconds, you see exactly if the performer has a full view 
or not. Reflecting back on it, the very opening I thought was already magical. It created, suspense is the wrong word, but, but um, it kind of wonder of where was he going to go with this. It might be paradoxical because we might just have to wait until the end to see if he or she has the full view, but actually it's not. It's right up at the beginning, the 10 first seconds. Really, in the grand scheme of Rachmaninoff's third concerto, when the Pumoso hits, it's not all of a sudden like, ah, here I am. It really isn't. It's, it's blending in with the orchestra, knowing full well that a short time later, yes, the piano will become the prominent voice. But I actually appreciated very much that he didn't feel compelled to immediately just shout out, here I am. Now, I used to think that when a pianist was described as playing structurally, it was just a euphemism for boring and lacking nuance. But I realized over time that it is indeed a real thing. And it's, in fact, much harder to pull off than just spreading rubato sauce all over every phrase. So the two things that structural playing requires are pulse and trajectory. Yunchan has both in his performance. Like I always say to young pianists, without a heartbeat, we're dead. Without pulse, music is dead, right? Where the pianist is not interfering with the pulse, but they're able to be flexible within the pulse. And, and that was a quality that spoke to me very much about the whole performance. Playing in sync with the orchestra is actually no straightforward matter in this section. You have to trust the conductor and the conductor has to trust you. So I think it's a testament to the conductor and soloist's chemistry that they were able to unify the ensemble, not just for this section, but really the entire work. Now you can play with pulse, but without direction. So to play with direction, you have to know your long-term goals. And you have to find ways to create a feeling of trajectory and arrival. Here's how Yun Chun starts the Pumoso right after the opening theme. See if you notice anything about it. Now, it seems like a small thing, but this kind of effect sends a signal to the listener's ear that these seemingly never-ending Rachmaninoff phrases actually have definite contours. Rachmaninoff himself does this too in his own performance of the piece. You can sort of think of it as making the first letter of a new chapter a bigger and fancier font and a different color from the rest of the text. Then Yun Chan keeps a pulse and he lets the music breathe and follow a long arc before finally arriving at the end of the opening section. Now, some pianists like to arrive multiple times when they're playing music like this, and it's a bit disconcerting. It's, it's as if the pilot of your airplane just informed you upon landing that he'll need to take off one more time and then land again, and then take off one more time and then land again. Yunshan sends you on a single flight from the beginning of this Toccata section to the end, and then he uses this little suffix moment at the end of the section to create a very new sound with a new attack. See, it sounds like a whole new instrument that we haven't heard before. Uh, this brings a sense of finality, almost like he's shutting the door on the opening section and locking it. Now Yun Chan uses more than just capitalization and punctuation, if we're going to continue this metaphor. He also annotates Rachmaninoff's text. Watch towards the end of the second theme area. There's this left-hand crossover moment. Now, most pianists are just trying to keep the energy up and not miss the left-hand crossover notes, which sometimes happens. But Listen to what Yun Chan does. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. 
Then in the ensuing development section, Yunshan uses carefully placed accents to help emphasize the polyphony of this music. The canon between the right and left hands is actually especially clear in the way he plays it. Listen. This is also crucial to Rachmaninoff because the textures are so dense, you have to know which layers are more important than others, and you have to articulate them very clearly. Yunchan also underlines notes that contribute to the structure or design of a phrase. So in this buildup here, it's very subtle, but listen to the control and phrasing of Yunshan's bass line. Now, polyphony is important to Rachmaninoff. This is a composer who studied counterpoint very seriously and was deeply familiar with the works of Johann Sebastian Bach, even transcribing some of his pieces. Now here I want to acknowledge Yun Chan Lim's teacher, Min Su Son, Korean pianist who is just as at home in Rachmaninoff as he is in Bach. You can find him on YouTube playing both the Rock Three, as well as Bach's Goldberg variations. And there you can hear just the most noble sensitivity to Bach's counterpoint. Now you can hear this dedication to Baroque clarity in Min Son's performance of Rachmaninoff. You can hear it in this Toccata section, which in his performance has never sounded more Baroque. Following the bass line, polyphonic accents, punctuating harmonically important notes and chords, this is all crucial in Rachmaninoff because it's really easy for this flurry of notes to overwhelm and disorient the listener. Yunchan differentiates his textures so your ear can perceive a distinctive image emerging from the thousands of little brushstrokes. Now, I bring up Yunchan's teacher because Although I hear lots of similarities in their two performances of the Rock 3, I also notice differences. While Yunchan is dedicated to bringing out Rachmaninoff's counterpoint, he also plays in the shadows more than his teacher does. So, in his opening theme, sometimes notes are almost inaudible. I have to admit, this put me off at first. I wasn't really sure what he was up to. But as I kept listening, I became more and more convinced by this play between shadow and light in Yunshan's performance. When the theme comes back, there's a wonderful example of this. Just listen to this moment. Did you notice it? When the harmony changes from C major to C minor here, it's not unusual to hear a pianist's voice to their left hand. It creates a kind of darker sonority. Yunshan's voicing is so dark here, it's almost exaggerated. But then a cool thing happens. A couple bars later, he then shines the light on the right hand of the phrase. Now, another cool place where Yunshan plays with dark and light is after the big development climax in the aftermath as the music's settling down before the cadenza. Just listen to it. What Yunchan does here is pretty terrifying. There's contrapuntal voices emerging in and out of the shadows, and it's a really chilling effect. Now, another really noteworthy thing about Yunchan's performance is he doesn't play the so-called big cadenza of the first movement. He sticks with the cadenza that's actually written in the main line of the text. That first movement cadenza, I was mm -hmm. thrilled he did the smaller cadenza it was so masterful his his voicing in that cadenza his pacing in that cadenza and while you might be used to the big cadenza it's actually not the cadenza chosen by some of the most famous interpreters of this work Listen to this climactic arrival point, which can so often sound just over the top bombastic. Yunshan sounds utterly proportional to the rest of interpretation and really well earned. 
It's extremely in control, but at the same time impassioned. I also appreciate very much his ability to sing in big chords. There is nothing more difficult than creating a legato line when you play big chords because they might just sound all the same. Now in Yunchun's cadenza, all of these strategies I've been discussing are at play. Trajectory, pulse, uh, punctuation and annotation, polyphony, dark and light, and they all start working together. Now later after the wind interlude, when the piano is settling down in E-flat, Yunshan just absolutely beautiful things in differentiating the texture of Rachmaninoff's score. Just take this one part. I absolutely love this. Listen to his left hand here. It's so good. I can honestly say I've never heard any pianist articulate that voice quite like Yunshan does. This voice sounds like it's alive and independent of the other elements in the texture. Then a moment later, we hear Yunshan absolutely relish Rachmaninoff's most dissonant, beautiful chords. Listen. See, he just suspends on that chord a little longer than most pianists would. Listen, he does it again here. But what I was really curious about was, was the second movement. I felt like he was able to access such a personal tenderness, which is hard for me to imagine an 18 year old having that quality that comes through living life. Yunshan's rock three second movement is filled with the kind of nuance you tend to only hear from really mature seasoned concert pianists. left hand in this section. This is really world-class layering. And Yunshan is really listening and accentuating these inner voices that I actually heard anybody point out before in their interpretation. Yunshan's second movement also shows his ability to create orchestral effects on the piano. So first, just listen to this absolutely insane bass note. What? <laughs> what sound is that? It doesn't sound like a piano at all. It actually sounds like he pulls out a bass drum and just whacks it with a mallet when he reaches over right there. It's totally crazy. And again, he's taking a page out of Horowitz's playbook here. Horowitz's bass notes are legendary. Yunshan also employs other Horwitzian bass note techniques by slightly delaying the bass note to give it a kind of resonance and aura. Take a listen. This is another trademark of Horwitz, and I was actually lucky enough to talk to Manny Axe about this very thing. You notice one of the things he does that's a very Horwitz thing. No, 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 no. After. After. Mm -hmm. I, of course, I copy that in, in, in the other Polonaise. The heroic. Which is what he does. It's a wonderful idea. Now, another relevant thing Manny told me in that interview is that Horowitz used to make certain notes sound almost ugly. And there comes a moment. <laughs> <laughs> da, 
that that note was actually ugly in the context it was one of the most electrifying things i've ever heard yeah. you know now yunshan uses a really similar effect in the waltz of the second movement of rock three just take a listen listen to how his accident notes almost sound like lightning strikes that are completely alien in the rest of this otherwise delicate environment. Now let's flash forward to a moment in the third movement because Yunshan does something quite similar and in doing so he plays probably four of my favorite notes I've ever heard anybody play on the piano. I, I literally laughed out loud the first time I heard this. I, I couldn't believe anyone had the guts to do this kind of thing. It's just so groovy you have to listen to it. Yeah! Boom, 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 boom. All right, one more time. It's so good. It's so stupidly good. That's my kind of shit. Now, it's in this third movement that Yun Chun Lim really separates himself from the pack. And it really does seem like what one pianist mentioned to me, that Yun Chun is playing possessed here. So let's just start with the segue to the third movement. I absolutely love the way Yun Chun delivers this phrase. It's like there's a predator lurking in the trees who snarls once, snarls twice. Then on the third snarl, Yunshan just launches, erupts. And here we have one of the most iconic moments. He turns to the orchestra and says, are y'all ready for this? Now make no mistake, this is not Yun Chan turning the orchestra, worrying about whether they're going to be together with them, ready to chastise them for not playing the way he wished they would play. Rather, he's saying, you're my people, you're with me, let's do this thing. And they did. Now, a word about speed. It's not true that this is the fastest last movement tempo ever taken. There are definitely faster ones, most notably Argerich's last movement. But whereas I notice that Argerich is absolutely flying, I have to say I'm not thinking about speed when I listen to Yunshan. We were all joking that he has this turbo button that he can press whenever he needed it. From the very first note till the very end of the concerto, there was never any sense that he would lack power or speed. But it really all served the music. This was also personally for me very satisfying because I like this concerto playing rather fast. And my, my ideal version, so to speak, is, is, is Zoltan Kocic. So I think what matters here it makes Yunshan's tempo so great is not just that it's high speed, but that he's using the speed to create a soaring line from start to finish in this movement. Now, the goal of music making is not to show that you can play as loud as possible and as fast as possible, of course not. But you can speak very fast, as I'm doing now, but I make the pose in order to be understood. It wasn't about his ego, it was about serving the music. It was the most unselfish playing. Now one underrated thing that Yunshan does is really observe the tempo markings in Rachmaninoff's score. For example, in this really pulsating chordal theme after all of the pyrotechnics that come before it, as Garrick Olson points out, this is one of the hardest technical spots in the piece and part of the reason is that Rachmaninoff actually indicates that you need to go faster. Lots of pianists don't go faster. For example, Horowitz in 1978 does not go faster here, and you can even see some discomfort in this passage. Giard, um, the second chord is almost a reflex of the first.
Latin sounds like this in a not good performance. Now the worst part of it is finding the low C. It's hard to find because it's like snow blindness. White keys are more difficult than the black keys. In the recap, Rachmaninoff brings the same passage back in B-flat. Not only does he go faster than the tempo just preceding it, he goes even faster than when it was in C major in the exposition and is absolutely flying. He took some enormous risk. <laughs> and we all know how this papadam, 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 papadam. That was a ride, but he was absolutely in control with his horses, you know. Um, it was a young master at work, a young yeah. master at work. I mentioned earlier the chemistry Yunshan has with Marin Alsop, the conductor. And you can just see in this moment that she's just having absolutely the time of her life. Watch this. It's like Yun Chan is creeping up behind her and tickling her. She's like, woo! Oh! Now, one of the things I love that Yun Chan does is he knows when to lift up his pedal. And he creates these really cool, sparkly, dry effects. Take this passage later in the piece. Pianists often like to whip these arpeggios and give a nice crescendo at the end of each one. Yunshan not only does that, but he actually lifts the pedal and creates this dry effect. This is something I notice in Yuja's playing. So for example, in that arpeggio that just scales the keyboard right before the third movement, Yuja takes the pedal off and it's pretty cool. Now, I haven't mentioned the word passion all that much when describing this performance. And you might be wondering, that's odd. This is one of the most passionate pieces ever written. Now, Yunshan is filled with passion, but it's restrained passion. It's, it's contained. He knows when to let it out. And when he lets it out, I believe it. It sounds sincere. For example, listen to his rubato in this beautiful arrival point. There's just something about the way he executes the timing there that just sounds right to me. Now, another absolutely iconic moment. One might criticize Yunshan here for not respecting the tempo established by his esteemed conductor. But if you watch carefully, Marin Alsop is completely aware of what Yunshan's about to do. And frankly, they both pull it off with great effect. It's like this 18-year-old kid is the general of an army, this orchestra who he's calling into battle, and they're all about to gallop to victory in this piano competition. Okay, I've mentioned Horowitz a couple times, and now I want to prove to you, definitively, that Yunshan Lim is absolutely influenced by Horowitz, and almost certainly, he's watched this baby. Now to prove this, you have to listen carefully, and watch carefully. Yun Chan, although he respects Rachmaninoff's score very much, sometimes likes to alter it. And just as Horowitz would do, Yun Chan throws in extra bass notes when he feels like it. And when he gets to this incredible point of tension, Yun Chan says, I'm not going to play what Rachmaninoff says. I need something even more powerful that really captures the monumental moment. Yunshan's just riding that left hand all the way to the bottom of the keyboard. <laughs> now, most kids, when they're ending a piano competition, are in trepidation about what the jury might think of them, especially if they alter a score. Yunshan says, nah, if it works, I'm doing it. If I like it, I'm doing it. <laughs> There is one world didn't mention so far is the world nobility nothing cheap and this nobility coming from this young 18 years old man was something i was very impressed with 
Yun Chan's sound was enormous, right? It, he cut through the orchestra every moment he needed to cut through the orchestra, but it wasn't vicious. You know, you hear a lot of young pianists who, in their attempt to produce a big sound, the sound can get ugly, as opposed to just kind of pulling out this magnificent, fat orchestral sound that he did and has the physical ability to transcend any difficulties in that score. Now we've compared Yun Chan to many pianists in this video, but one that I haven't mentioned is the famous Russian pianist Grigory Sokolov. And here I have to say that Yun Chan's technique reminds me a whole lot of Sokolov's. Just the way he's throwing his entire arm into some of these climactic chords. I mean, to imagine from an 18 year old to have a moment like that, which the world took such notice of, will stick with him and, and with everyone for a very long time. I have played Rachmaninoff III, uh, never again. It's now it belongs to Yun Chun. <laughs> Well, that's it. What do you think? Am I gushing a little too much about Yun Chan's performance? Do you think it's a little overrated? Is it one of the greatest of all time? Is it the GOAT? Did it deserve all the hype? Now, I want to know what you think of Yun Chan's performance.